QuickBooks Online Profit and Loss P&L Income Statement Overview. Get ready to start moving on up with QuickBooks Online. We're going to be using the free QuickBooks Online test drive, searching in our online search engine for QuickBooks Online test drive, picking the option that has Intuit.com in the URL, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks. We're going to select the United States version of the software and verify that we're not a robot. Scrolling in a bit by holding down control up on the scroll wheel, currently at 125% on the zoom in. In the cog drop down, we're noting that we're in the business view. Uh, I'm sorry, we're in the accountant view as opposed to the business view. We'll try to toggle back and forth between the two views so you can see where things are located within them. Duplicating the tab up top to put reports in as we do every time, right clicking on the tab to duplicate it. Right click it on the duplicated tab to duplicate it. Back to the middle tab as the right tab is thinking to go to the reports on the left and then open the balance sheet. As that's thinking, tab to the right, go to the reports on the left hand side. This time the P&L, the profit and loss, the income statement, which is our report of focus this time. I'm going to scroll up and close the hamburger as otherwise known as the ham boogie and range to the change from 010122 tab 123122 tab run it to refresh it and then back to the tab in the middle close in the boogie and scrolling up and we're going to range to the change from 010122 tab 123122 tab run it to refresh it and then now we're going to go to the tab to the right that's the setup process we do every time these are our major two financial statement reports support accounting instruction by clicking the link below giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website broken out by category further broken out by course each course then organized in a logical reasonable fashion making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a youtube page we also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. In the prior section, we were focusing in on the balance sheet, which represents where we stand as of a point in time. Now we're focusing on the income statement. So there's kind of a primary difference between these two types of reports. And you also want to keep that in mind as you look at other reports, because remember, all other reports for the most part give more information about one or multiple line items on either the balance sheet or the income statement. So it's useful to look at every report and ask the question, is this telling me where I am at a point in time? Or is this telling me a performance report what happened over a time frame needing a beginning and an end let's just emphasize that a little bit more here by taking a look at the balance sheet which we've been looking at in prior sections and you can kind of ask the question about an account on here such as accounts as the checking account if i asked you how much money you have at this point in time you can look in the bank and answer the question as of this point in time you don't need a beginning date in order to answer the question as opposed to if I go to the income statement and pick an account, and if I ask how much revenue did you earn, you can't really answer that question without making an assumption. The assumption being, what do you mean? Do you mean last month, last week, last paycheck period, last year? So you can kind of think of the income statement accounts as though I would think of it similar to if you kind of drive for so long or a time frame like a like a day and you want to see how far you went, you would have to then reset the odometer or at least set whatever starting points you're at as your zero and then count how far you went. That's what the income statement is doing. We reset it back to zero. That's the closing process and then count up in all the accounts involved income and expense accounts. The difference between the two being the net income. So let's do the same thing we did basically on the balance sheet. I'm going to try to close everything from the inside out and and then analyze our income statement so i'm going to close everything up thusly 
and break it down to its bare bone, bare minimum on the income statement. Now, if this was a single step income statement, you can even think of it as, as smaller than this. You could just say, well, it's gonna be income or revenue. That's the what we earned minus the expenses. Everything else would be the expenses would get us down to net income. We would call that like a single step income statement. And then we're gonna add other steps in the income statement for really critical components as we get down on our truck down to the bottom line of net income. That includes the cost of goods sold. And then we might have like other expenses and other income down below. So let's first go to the first tab here. I'm gonna open up my general ledger so we can compare the general ledger to the accounts that we're using. So we're gonna go into the accounting and go into see the accounts. And here's our chart of accounts. The chart of accounts is grouped as balance sheet accounts on top of income statement accounts. So I'm gonna scroll down. Here's where the income statement accounts start. And you can see that the triangles that we have collapsed now are collapsed by account type, income type of accounts, and then cost of goods sold, expense type of accounts. That's what we have here. Now also just wanna point out at this point, since we looked at the balance sheet, you might ask how is the income statement or profit and loss related to the balance sheet. So if I go to the balance sheet, you'll recall that down here in the equity section, or you may recall, we've got net income down here in the equity section. So that's important to note that link because the balance sheet is the accounting equation. If I collapse all this, it's the double entry accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus equity. If that's the double entry accounting equation, how is it that the income statement fits into the double entry accounting system because I don't see assets, liabilities, or equity on the income statement, but it must be part of the double entry accounting system, right? The reason is because you can kind of think of the balance sheet once again, as a point in time, the income statement is giving more detail on how we got to this point on the balance sheet. And that detail can kind of be broken out in summary in the equity section, which represents assets minus liabilities, kind of the net worth of the company and the net worth of the company has been impacted in the last year by the earnings of net income, which we could see rolls into the balance sheet. And if I was to go to the next period up and change the date up top to 2023 to 12-31-23, it would roll into uh, the retained earnings. So it's not really natural or it's not normal for the reporting purposes to have net income on the balance sheet oftentimes. But I think that's QuickBooks way of saying, hey, look, there's a link between the income statement and the balance sheet. This is how they are related. This is the net value assets minus liabilities. The income statement is giving us a story of how we got to this point in time. It's not the whole story. It's just, it's just one year back in the story. Also note that if you learned accounting, you would call that the closing process. We closed out the income statement to, you know, the balance sheet account. And you could think of the closing process happening at the end of any period, like the end of the month, you can think of it closing out. But notice that QuickBooks is doing it automatically here. So QuickBooks has to basically come up with a determination of when they're going to close this out. And it's going to be as of, you know, the end of the year. So it's going to be the, the year to date number. I mean, it's going to be the net income. You can't really, you can't really close out. It's not going to report the same as if you're going to close out the month. For example, if I went up top here and I said, I just want the month of December. So I went from, from 120122 to 123122 and ran it. Then you would think down here that it might give you the, the net income just for the month of December and the rest would be in retained earnings. But that's not how it is. It's showing you the year to date number still in the net income. And that's kind of how it has to work. They have to, if you're going to have that automatic like closing process. So just something to, to keep in mind. I'm going to change this back from 010122 and then run it. So now let's go to the income statement and let's just open this up piece by piece. So income. Well, first of all, note up top, you have a difference in the name. It's January through December. Uh, you might sometimes hear it say called for the year ended. For the year ended is kind of the more formal way that you might say it. You could always change this title if you would like to uh, change the title 
but it indicates a beginning and ending point. Also note that QuickBooks calls it a profit and loss report, which is fine, but in formal accounting terms, oftentimes it'll be referred to as an income statement. So again, you could change this up top to be to call it an income statement and then change possibly the, the date here to be to be for the year ended or something like that if you wanted to do some more customization. I'm not sure if you could change this range. You can you can add it or remove it, but you can change the profit and loss. We'll talk about that in the formatting later. So that's just a little difference in the terminology. And a lot of times when you learn just accounting, it'll be called an income statement. Here it's called a profit and loss. In essence, the same report. Then at the top of this, we've got income. Now income, you might sometimes call revenue. So if you look at an income statement, you might call this first grouping revenue, or you might call it income. You want to keep that different from the subtotals and the bottom line, which is gross profit. That's a subtotal along the way. That's different than income. Net income is different than income. That's net of all the expenses. That's the bottom line in essence of the income statement. So income or revenue generation, that's the goal of the business. So, so that's gonna be the key point. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase the revenue of the business. And even when we look at the balance sheet, that's kind of our primary objective. We want to keep that in mind. If I look at the balance sheet and I look at my accounting equation, the reason we have assets in the business, the reason we have it in a business account as assets, as opposed to our personal account is because we're kind of the assets are an investment in essence in the business. Oftentimes we're investing in property, plant and equipment. So we put the capital assets into the business to buy the property, plant and, and equipment in order to generate revenue in the future. So revenue is the point. The liabilities and equity are the financing. Those are the ways that we're financing the assets. If we don't need the assets in the business, we should give it to ourselves as the owner in the form of a draw or dividends if it was a corporation. So the assets are there as an investment to generate future revenue. The liabilities and equities in essence are the way that we finance the assets in order to generate revenue in the future. The income statement represents the revenue that we have earned for a prior period, often reported in the format of a year, a month, or, or a quarter, for example. So then uh, within the revenue, we usually only have a couple accounts in our revenue or income type of accounts, because oftentimes we only do, you know, one or two things. We focus on what we're doing to generate revenue and we purchase everything else. But because this is a construction company, we have a little bit more revenue than you might otherwise expect. Some common categorizations for many businesses would be service revenue versus the sale of product revenue. These are common kind of breakouts that you might have in a business. What you want to be careful of is not getting, not breaking your revenue out in too many accounts because it can muddy up, cloud up your income statement. And uh, the, well, the common way that people do that is they put revenue accounts in here that represent uh, customers. So you don't want to have a revenue account, a different revenue account per customer usually. And one of the reasons you don't want to do that is because you can break out that added information if you have a full service accounting system with other reports breaking out the revenue by customer. Now, sometimes you can't if you don't use a full service accounting system. So if you're creating your books from bank feeds, then you might not have the added detail because you're not using the natural reports. Remember that the revenue accounts are naturally going to be increased with an invoice and the sales receipt. If you're properly using invoices and sales receipts to record revenue, then you should have a sub ledger account that can break out by detail of customer and by item, inventory items or service items that you're selling. However, if you're doing gig work or something and you're just using bank feeds to generate your income statement account, then you're not gonna have the added detail. You might not have the sub ledger accounts that can break out revenue by customer or by by item because you're using a deposit form so so you still might want to do that but that in that case you might actually name your revenue accounts by your vendor you might say like youtube revenue account <laughs> or amazon revenue account whatever platform gig work you're getting from you might just simply call that the revenue account that's kind of the exception uh to the rule and say so then we've got our total income which is a subtotal along the way 
and then cost of goods sold. You would only have cost of goods sold if you sell inventory. Now, remember that if you sell inventory, there's a couple different ways you might track inventory. You might try to stick on a cash-based system, in which case you're gonna, you're gonna record cost of goods sold when you purchase the inventory, and then just record the sales side when you sell the inventory, instead of recording it as an asset first, and then, and then decreasing the asset and recording cost of goods sold when, when you sell the product. And you would only do that if you don't have much inventory on hand and possibly if you're buying the inventory for a specific job, for example. But most of the time, if you have significant inventory, you have to record the inventory on the books, on the balance sheet here as inventory. Now you might do that on a perpetual inventory system or a periodic inventory system. Notice that the inventory is an accrual account. We're deviating from a cash base because we have to, because the inventory is significant and therefore we put it on the books as an asset and we expense it as we consume it. If we do that on a periodic inventory system, I might track the inventory units on an external sheet like Excel and then record the purchases in inventory as an asset and then count my inventory and compare it to what I have in my, my Excel sheet, my accounting equation for cost of goods sold, beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory would then allow us to do an adjustment, decreasing inventory periodically at the end of the week, day, month, and then recording cost of goods sold. Or if you do a perpetual inventory system, then the inventory is gonna, gonna be recorded as cost of goods sold when we create a sales receipt or an invoice, and it will also have the sub ledger impacted. So it'll decrease inventory and record the cost of goods sold. Now cost of goods sold, is gonna be the most important expense if you sell inventory. If that's the primary thing you sell, then the highest cost in order to generate the revenue will be the cost of goods sold typically because that's gonna be the most expensive thing. That's why it's such an important subtotal for many companies that sell stuff. And that's why we have this other kind of stop along the way to get to net income called gross profit. So gross profit as opposed to net income is just the revenue minus the cost of goods sold. So we're just taking a pit stop along the way to get to net income. So we got the revenue of 102.77 minus the cost of goods 405. Now the cost of goods sold is much lower in this case because you know we do other things other than sell uh, the the inventory in this case. But if you just sold inventory, you would think the relationship between cost of goods sold and income would be you know significant. So then you got the gross profit and then you've got the biggest category, which is all other expenses. So the other expenses are categorized like we normally think of them. So we have things like, you know, advertising, automobile, equipment, insurance. We're labeling these items for the name of what they're used for. Once again, not labeling them as the name of the vendor. So in other words, we're not calling this progressive insurance or whatever for our insurance. We're just calling it insurance, whatever the insurance is for. We're not calling the the deck and patio Joe's contractor. We're calling it deck and patio because that's basically what we purchased in the system. Now, notice that when you when you group these items, some of them are pretty straightforward because you can you know the categories because they're just familiar for business like repairs and maintenance. They, they do this one backwards. I don't know why I would call it repairs and maintenance. They call it maintenance and repairs office expenses, rent, and so on. And, but sometimes you have, you have things that are specific to your business. And when you set up your chart of accounts, that's what's gonna be listing these items. And you usually have the most variant in the expenses, depending on the industry that you're in. And I think QuickBooks Online still just gives you pretty much a generic chart of accounts, no matter what industry you choose. So therefore you might wanna go into the chart of accounts and make adjustments to it. Uh, when you first start a company file and what i would recommend for that process is when you have your chart of accounts that you start in you, you keep in general the chart of accounts that they provide you with although you might make some tweaks to it at first and then as you do data input you're going to see every time you do a data input you're going to see if the chart of accounts has an account that is is relevant that fits and if it does you're going to use that one and if it doesn't 
then you you and they have one that's closed but you don't like the name like they put maintenance and repairs and you want repairs and maintenance then you could go in here and edit the account to whatever you want it to be instead of adding a new account that is very similar in name and then after like two months of data input or so at least then you could go into the chart of accounts and possibly uh, remove some some of the accounts that you're not using that's what i would generally recommend if you're starting a new company file or make them inactive so the chart of accounts is also a place i mean the the, the expense accounts are oft also a place where people can get extreme on either end either being very detailed or being not detailed enough so some people that are very detailed they make way too many categories and they make way too many subcategories. And by doing that, you're going to extend the, the chart of account is going to get quite long or your income statement is going to get quite long. And the added information, the added detail is actually going to be taken away possibly from, from your decision making process because there's just too much to really take in there. Uh, other people go the other way and they just don't add enough detail so you can't you can't like if you were just to have one account called expenses that wouldn't be enough detail you need more detail than that in order to make decisions and and just to fill out a tax return uh for it you can't just put on the tax return expenses add it up to 5,237 right you got to categorize it somewhere so that's just one thing to kind of be aware of you want to be somewhere in the middle generally uh, between those two now notice that this drop down, this carrot represents the, the account type. These other carrots are sub accounts. So notice that this one automobile, it's common to have automobile and then possibly the things that you spent on automobile. This is where it gets a little confusing too, because you might have fuel, but you might have like insurance as well. And you might have maintenance, for example, but insurance, for example, is one that you might group under automobile or you might put under insurance, right? So it gets a little bit uh, confusing to, to group some of those. The thing that's also nice about these sub accounts, however, is that notice that within the expense category, because there's so many accounts, if you're not using account numbers, it's going to default to grouping these accounts by grouping these accounts by alphabetical order within the expenses. So using the sub accounts is a way that you can kind of group things together uh, without account numbers. If you want to use account numbers, that's another way that you can group things, but you got to be careful and make sure that you're, you're not, you're, you're using the account numbers properly. I think we'll have a section on that. So you can kind of look on, on how to use account numbers if you would like to also note that you can also change the sorting options to sort by uh, total descending. And I'm going to run that one. And then within the categories down here, if I scroll down to the expense categories, you can see, for example, uh, within here, now I've got my highest number within that category up top. So it sorts the categories a, a little bit differently. That's another thing you can kind of test out and see if it gives you an, a more optimal sorting pattern without using account numbers. I'm gonna change it back to the default. So I'm gonna go back up top and let's say I'm gonna sort I'm going to sort it by, here's the sort. I'm going to sort it by the default again. Scroll down. Now note that as you add these, these drop downs, they, they give you a, a lot more detail, but they also make the report when expanded a lot larger, which can be kind of an issue because you, you, you've, you've added a line here, you've added a line here and you've got the total that's added. So it's a couple lines that have been added. However, you can also compress them when you want to be displaying the report. So you, you have the opportunity to have an extended version of the report or a smaller version of the report. Now, also just realize that when we have these sub accounts, there's other options that you can use for sorting and filtering that we touched on. So if you have multiple locations, for example, you might try to use class tracking, location tracking, uh, where you can basically make an income statement that has multiple columns. So that's another method that you can use that might be used in conjunction with or instead of like a sub account system. If you want to break out by location, for example, we saw the tags as well, which is another way that you can kind of sort your data and, and something to keep in mind. So when you start to think about, okay, different kinds of sortings, do I want to have it in a sub account like this? 
or do I want to make make an income statement that has multiple columns, possibly using a feature like class tracking, location tracking, or the tags, which can get a little bit complex because you could do similar things with, with different options, which we might touch on a little bit uh, in future presentations. So notice the default here has a lot of these triangles for the sub accounts. So I think personally, they went a little overboard on the sub accounts and the utilities down here. Here's another one where you might say, maybe I want the gas and electric and the telephone under utilities. Maybe I just want the telephone in its own account these days and just call gas and electric utilities because I just think of gas and electric as in essence utilities uh, these days. It's kind of a default, just depends on your preference. Okay, so that gives us our total expenses. Last time we left off on the gross profit up top, which was at, where was the gross profit? The gross profit is here at the 97. Okay, so now we've got our expenses. I'll collapse it of the 52. So minus the 5237.31 gets us to our operating income. The reason the operating income is useful and is different than net income is because that's that's the income where you're going to say it gives you the most predictive power into the future because you're you're saying these are things that I needed for operations. These expenses were consumed in order to help me generate revenue and they're things that I would expect to happen again in the future in proportion to, to my income possibly. And then you might have some other items down below where you're saying, hey, look, these other items, which might be income or expenses, are not part of my normal operations. So you might put things down here and it will depend on, you know, you can look at generally accepted accounting standards and whatnot or, or different standards in terms of what they recommend should be reported down here, or you might have your own kind of thought process for it. So for example, you might say that this is this is my net income from normal operations and you might consider financing which would be interest expense and possibly investments like interest income as not part of your normal operations so you might say hey look the interest income and expenses i don't want to put that in my net operating income because it's it's not really part of my core business although i had some expenses for interest income and expenses therefore i'm going to put them down here so that when I pro make projections into the future, I can see what is there related to my business and what is there that's kind of outside of my business down here and then and then get to the net income. Uh, you, you also might say from generally accepted accounting standards kind of concepts, you might say, well, if something is not likely to happen, you know, in the future it was a it was an unusual event, an unusual loss that like a like a hurricane or something and you don't live in a place that has hurricanes or and it just came out of nowhere and you had this big loss well then you might report it down here somewhere and say hey look this was lost for this totally way weird thing that i don't want to put up as my operating income because i want to show my i want to show when i project into the future which is part of the reason of the financial statements that i don't expect that to happen again because it was an unusual event so those are some so that will then get you down to the net in to the to the this is the other net income and then that's going to get you down to the net income with which, which is the bottom line so we had this amount minus the the other expenses and uh the net so this is going to be minus the 2916 is going to get us down to the 1642. So that's the that's the income statement basically in general. In future presentations, we'll we'll run some comparative income statements and so on in a similar fashion as we did with the balance sheet and uh, move on from there. I'm going to go back to the first tab and just note that if I hit the cog drop down and scroll down to I'm going to scroll down to the business view, I believe We've just been located here in the chart of accounts. The chart of accounts is under the bookkeeping tab and the chart of accounts under the business view. And we've gone into the reports, which is under the business overview. No, the reports are in the, yeah, that's right. The business overview. And then it, it won't take me to that other tab, the business overview. And then, and here you've got your reports. There it goes. The reports right there. That's where they are. All right.